join us in worship this morning.
There's got to be more than going back and forth from doing right to doing wrong. We were taught that's who we are. Come on, get in line right behind me. You along with everybody, making this worth in what you do. Then like a hero who takes the stage when we're on the edge of our seats, saying it's too let me introduce you to amazing grace. No matter the bumps, no matter the bruises, no matter the scars, still the truth is the cross has made, the cross has made you flawless. No matter the hurt or how deep the
Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Good morning. Morning, Justice. No, okay. So, who's the strongest person you guys know? God. God? Who's the strongest person you know? Everyone. Everyone? Is your dad pretty strong? <laughs> okay. <laughs> you think Pastor Adam's pretty strong? No? <laughs> How about Gabe? You think Gabe's pretty strong? I mean, he works outside with stuff a lot, maybe. Okay. Well, I didn't think we had that few strong people in the congregation, but. <laughs> so, in Exodus. It says, Moses held his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove back the sea with a strong east wind, and so he made the sea become dry ground. The water was split. You were right. God is the most powerful, because even as strong as Gabe is, he can't hold out his hand to make the water become dry ground. It would take him a whole lot to make water become dry ground, and he'd need a lot of help with that, wouldn't he? But God is strong enough and mighty enough that he can do anything that needs to be done. And you know what? He can help you guys too. So if you guys need something that you need somebody strong, God is there to help give you strength every day and to give you people who can help you do things. So we want to remember that God is stronger than all of us, but he's there to help us out. Okay? You guys can walk back to Children's Church. A um, couple announcements. Bye. So Kids Quizzing had regional quiz this week, and we had a couple people who did really well. So Meredith was part of the blue level team, which is the older kids, and she was on the third place regional all-star team. So that's a phenomenal job. Louise was on the third place regional all-star red team and also placed seventh overall in the regional. Okay, so let's give it up for our Bible quizzers. <laughs> 
and I was told that I didn't need to do this or say this, but we need to give a little hand to our pastor who finished his certificate in media communications from Full Sail University uh, this week, and he decided he wanted to be like my kids and got his acceptance letter for Mount Vernon Nazarene University to start a program in the fall. So let's give it up for Pastor Adam. You should have known not to give me a mic. Um, we do have family youth group tonight or all church youth group tonight, so everybody's invited to come back tonight. We've got some activities planned. We're going to be talking about 1 Corinthians 16, and we've got some good food that's going to be provided tonight. Um, so come on back at 6 o'clock tonight, and we'll have a good time as a church family. How is everybody? <laughs> wonderful. I heard a wonderful. I've still got cars on my, my podium. Whoever put them there, if they want them back, they're going to have to fight me. What? Testing my ADD, you are correct. Yeah. So, uh, and I would like to attest that Gabe is not as strong as Carrie thinks he is. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, Carrie took care of a lot of the announcements this morning. Uh, so, that's good. Come back tonight for all church. Uh, we do have a board meeting after church, if you didn't catch my text messages and emails. Um, so hopefully we can hang out for just a few minutes after church, a few minutes, maybe four hours. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> Depends on how decisive y'all are. So cool. Let's jump in. Uh, we are on week five of the Forerunner series about John the Baptist. Uh, we've learned a lot about John so far. He's the forerunner. He's the one that preceded Jesus. Uh, he wasn't present for Jesus' birth or death or resurrection uh, or even the birth of the church, which is today, Pentecost. Um, today is the birthday of the church. And uh, if you haven't, or if you haven't for a while, read Acts chapter 2 today. I recommend that. Uh, and if you're feeling really spunky, read the whole, chat, the whole book of Acts. It's a great book, and it will help you understand how the church was formed and how it spread across the world. So John was, he was still a major influence, though, in the, on the movement that we call Christianity today. So how did John contribute to Christianity? Uh, we call John John the Baptist because his first influence on Christianity was about baptism, specifically. 
John gave us baptism as a sign of our repentance and allegiance to Jesus. John wasn't the first to baptize people, but he was the first to use baptism as a way for people to, to demonstrate that they were sorry for their sins uh, and wanted to get right with God. John also told us that Jesus was coming. Uh, throughout the Old Testament, books and prophets foretold the coming of the Savior. God told us about it in Genesis 3, as early as Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve first sinned. Moses promised that a prophet like himself would come one day. Isaiah prophesied the Messiah's coming. So did Jeremiah, Daniel, Micah, Zechariah, and Malachi. But after Malachi, the voices of the prophets fell silent. No prophet spoke, and no biblical books were written between 400 B.C. and 1 A.D. So it was John who, who broke the silence, essentially. Six months before Jesus started his public ministry, John came on the scene to tell us that Jesus was indeed coming. John spent six months calling people to repentance, before Jesus came on the scene. John gave Jesus his first sermon. John's preaching was so powerful that Jesus actually adopted John's message. John's central message was repent because the kingdom of heaven has come near. Jesus' first recorded sermon took place in the town of Nazareth. His message was repent because the kingdom of heaven has come near. So we're going to be looking at the passage of Scripture that describes John's most important moment. And in that moment, John introduced Jesus to the world and to his first disciples. So you can turn your Bibles to John chapter 1 if you'd like. So we can visit that here in just a little bit. And finally, next week, we'll conclude our Forerunner series with the story of how he was the first martyr of the Christian era. So if we, if we live our lives correctly, over the next, say, 12 months, you and I are going to have 365 opportunities to introduce people to Jesus. And John's going to teach us how to do that. So let's look at the book of John, chapter 1. Matthew and Luke tell us the, the story of Jesus' birth from, from earth's perspective, but John kind of teaches us that story from heaven's perspective. Matthew and Luke start with the, the conception of the Son of God. John starts with uh, the eternal pre-existence of the Son of God. So John writes, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. So how old is Jesus? Anybody know? That's how old Jesus was. How old is he? Ageless. Ageless is the answer. That was kind of a trick question. He existed before time. He was born into the world at Christmas, but he was never born into the universe. Wrap your head around that one. He always was. So Jesus was not only there before the beginning began to begin, <laughs> he created the beginning. All things were created through him, and apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, and that the darkness did not overcome it. That's one of my favorite passages. Bible scholars call these five verses the prologue to the book of John. It's, it's the cosmic introduction of Jesus. At verse 6, John switches from before time into time, specifically into 29 A.D., he says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. John's purpose for coming was that all might believe through him. 
John the Apostle, the writer of the book, now clarifies the identity of John the forerunner, or John the Baptist, in verse 8, he says, He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. So John the writer spends the next 10 verses describing the mystery of Jesus. Then in verse 19, he comes back to, to John the forerunner again, and he says, This was John's testimony when the Jews from Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him, Who are you? He didn't deny it, but he confessed, I'm not the Messiah. What then? They asked him, are you Elijah? I'm not, he said. Are you the prophet? No, he answered. So Elijah was the Old Testament prophet who never died. Second Kings records that God took Elijah up to heaven without experiencing death. The prophet refers to a figure Moses spoke of in Deuteronomy 18 when he said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own brothers. You must listen to him. So with, with the advantage of history on our side, biblical scholars agree that this prophet was Jesus. But in 29 AD, people weren't sure if the prophet was the same person as the Messiah or not. John goes on to say, Who are you then, they asked. We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What can you tell us about yourself? He said, I'm a voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, just as Isaiah the prophet said. So we've studied the voice several times in this series so far. The voice is prophesied in Isaiah 40, verse 3. Moving on with John. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. So they asked him, Why then do you baptize if you aren't the Messiah, or Elijah, or the prophet? I baptize with water, John answered them. Someone stands among you, but you don't know him. He's the one coming after me whose sandal strap I am not worthy to untie. All this happened in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I told you about. After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he existed before me. I didn't know him, but I came baptizing with water so he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he rested on him. I didn't know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water told me, the one you see the Spirit descending and resting on, he is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. So this is a big moment. Since the time of the creation of the world, God has been waiting for this moment. It's the moment of the introduction of the Savior of the world to the world that he came to save. So John handles it pretty masterfully, I think. He puts on a clinic on how to introduce someone to Jesus. All of us have friends. All of us have neighbors. We have loved ones who have yet to meet Jesus. So if you're looking for a simple and effective outline on how to introduce the Savior to someone who needs to be saved over this next 365 days, this is it. This is a clinic on how to introduce your friends to Jesus. I thought that picture was hilarious. It's, it's, it's Buddy Christ. I don't know if you've seen those pictures, but... And we're going to figure out how to do this by doing what John did at the River Jordan that day. The first thing we're going to do is whet their appetite. There's an old adage that says you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. There's a newer adage that says, but you can feed him salt, which will make him thirsty, right? 
Colossians 4, 6 says, Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you would, should answer each person. John whets his friend's appetites the way, this kind of this way in verse 26 and 27 that we read. He says, Someone stands among you, but you don't know him. He is the one coming after me whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to untie. So one of the slave's jobs was to carry his master's sandals. John's basically saying, this master is far above me. I'm not only not worthy to carry his sandals, I'm not worthy of untying them. So as John's saying this, people, people start wondering, who is the guy this dude is talking about? I'd really like to meet him. So that's salting the conversation or wetting people's appetite. People have to want to know something about Jesus before you tell them about Jesus. Otherwise, you're going to bore them or push them away. John wets their appetites so that people want to know about Jesus. Once they're ready, then he tells them about Jesus. He's not pushy about it. Some of us Christians can be a little pushy. But if you look carefully, this is actually a two-part conversation. The text says he waited for this second part until the next day. Verse 29 says, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John taps into two needs here. First, he calls Jesus the Lamb of God. And that's an image every Jew understood and was waiting for. And centuries earlier, as Israel was, was exiting Egypt, God instituted a ceremony called Passover. We've all heard of that. In which every Jewish family brought a lamb into their house and sacrificed the lamb and an institution for their, for their own sins, basically. Every year... For 1,400 years, Jewish families sacrificed a lamb to take away their sins. John taps into this, this longing to have the living final lamb come into their home. And then John taps into their longing to have sin removed once and for all. They have to have constant, constant, constant sacrifices but then they wanted to have it removed once and for all. He says, this isn't just a lamb who takes away the sin of a single household. It's the lamb who takes away the sin of every person in the world. If you were a Jewish person sitting on the riverbank that day, you'd probably have chills running down your spine. John thought very carefully about the words that he used to describe Jesus that day. And after telling people about Jesus, John wets their appetites again because appetites wear off. So he resets their hopes by saying, this is the one I told you about. After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he existed before me. I didn't know him, but I came baptizing with water so he might be revealed to Israel. So what's he doing? He's, he's describing what Jesus can do for them. John testifies, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he rested on him. So in the Old Testament, prophets and, and other special people had the Holy Spirit come upon them temporarily. What sets Jesus apart is that the Holy Spirit did not depart from him. He rested on him and dwelt with him permanently. John 1, it says, I don't know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water told me, the one you see the, the Spirit descend on and rest on, he's the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So not only is he describing what Jesus can do for them, he's using a, a very simple technique that we call testifying. 
And that's step four. Tell them about your experience with Jesus. People can argue about facts and dates and whether something you say is true or right or not. But experience gives a situation a little bit more credibility. I saw the Spirit descend on him. I saw it. And I heard the Lord say to me, this is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So I saw it and I heard it. Who wouldn't want to be baptized with the Holy Spirit? Being baptized with the Holy Spirit means having the Spirit of God come and live inside of you. John then boldly reclaims this one I'm telling you about. I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. Now, because John, the gospel writer, compresses this event into just a page or so of dialogue, it seems like it all happened kind of instantaneously in one conversation. But look at this. The story starts in verse 18 with, this was John's testimony when the Jews from Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him, who are you? That's when he whets their appetites in verse 18 through 28. Verse 29 says, the next day. That's when John tells them about Jesus, verses 29 through 34. Verse 35 says, the next day. Verse 43 says, the next day. So this is a conversation that happened over four consecutive days. John doesn't rush it. He doesn't push people to accept Jesus. He doesn't argue with them on Facebook. But he does move the conversation along, day by day. On day three, verses 35 and 36, the text says, The next day, John was standing with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. John's continuing to introduce people to Jesus. But now that they know who Jesus is, John's calling for a commitment. So how do I know that? Because look at the response of the disciples starting in verse 37. The two disciples heard him say this and followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and noticed them following him, he asks them, what are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said, come and you'll see. Or come and see, depending on what translation you're using. And on the third day, John encouraged them to become a follower. So that's, that's the fifth step in introducing people to Jesus. So here's the process. You have a friend you care about. In order to fulfill their purpose in life and God's intentions for their eternity, they need a relationship with Jesus. We're going to whet their appetite. We're going to tell them about him. We're going to describe what he can do for them, help them meet the need. We're going to tell them about our experience with him, how he's changed our life, and what we've experienced through a relationship with him. And then we're going to encourage them to become a follower. You can do this. It's e Well, conceptually it's easy. But it's not hard to follow. What would it look like if you did? What could you say that would whet a friend's appetite to want to hear about Jesus? Once you've piqued your friend's curiosity, what words could you use to describe Jesus that would send chills down their spine? Maybe something like, you know, you know that weight that you're carrying these days? The weight could be from guilt or regret or sin or pressure. It could be from sorrow from losing a loved one or discouragement from some sort of failure. It could be the weight of debt. You know that weight you're carrying these days? Jesus can lift that weight and give you your joy back or your hope back. Everybody wants that. So the principle is this. 
just before you tell your friends about Jesus, think carefully about your friend's current need or greatest longing. Everybody has them, and only God can fulfill them fully. Bless you. You're welcome. You can be sure of this because Ecclesiastes 3.11 says he has also put eternity in their hearts. It's there. It's a longing whether they consciously know it or not. He's written eternity on all of our hearts. Inside of every person that you have ever locked eyes with, is a need that only God can fill. You can help them with it. And as Christians, it's kind of our responsibility to help them with it. You might be the only real Christian that they know, and your life might be the only scripture that they ever see. This could, this could all happen naturally in one conversation or it could happen over a series of conversations. Those conversations should probably happen over a series of days, but not weeks. Or you'll have to keep restarting the conversation, which could probably be awkward. And when it comes to en encouraging friends to become followers, give them an example prayer. For instance, they could say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner and in need of a Savior, and I invite you to be mine. It's short, it's an easy sentence, and if it's natural, you can expand on it or even explain it. Or just celebrate with them and, and encourage them to start living life like a follower of Jesus. So, Let's end by finishing this story real quick. John introduces the crowd to Jesus. Then he introduces some of his disciples to Jesus. Verse 38. So they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come and see, he replied. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard John and followed him. He first found his, his own brother, Simon, and told him, we found the Messiah, which is translated to the Christ. And he brought Simon to Jesus. When Jesus saw him, he said, you're Simon, son of John. You'll be called Cephas which is translated to Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. He found Philip and told him, follow me. Now Philip from, was from Bethsaida, the hometown of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and so did the prophets, Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nathanael asked him, Come and see, Philip answered. Then Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said about him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you, Jesus answered. Rabbi, Nathanael replied, you are the son of God, you're the king of Israel. And then Jesus responded to him, do you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You'll see greater things than this. Then he said, truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. So John's trying to, to show us two things here. First, each one reached one. And second, if you'll introduce people to Jesus, he'll take it from there. We don't have to do all the work. We just have to make the connection. Today is 
Today is the the best day of your life to become a follower of Jesus. We're going to do communion now. If you've got your elements, you can have them ready. If not, they're on the table by the door. I promise not to point you out if you get up. And as we, as we pray, I want to make sure we continue to pray for Dominique and pray for, for Rachel and the kids traveling. They're almost to uh, Pensacola, Florida. They woke up in Montgomery, Alabama this morning. And you don't realize how much she does until she's not here because I was running around like crazy this morning. She got the, the coffee stocked up for a couple weeks for y'all before she left and, and all that good stuff. So thank her when she gets back. She's pretty amazing. I'm going to fly down there tomorrow for two days and then I'll be back. So don't worry, you won't miss a Sunday without me. I know some of you are, darn it, I know, right? But so if you can pray for Dominique and Rachel and the kids. If we need to pray for for anybody, if there's somebody on your heart, on your mind, or if you have a pressure that you need to just let go, these altars are always open as we finish up communion, um, I invite you as we pray to come up to these altars and just lay it before Jesus. We won't stop in an awkward spot and just leave you up here. If you come up, I'll know and we'll, we'll make time. Matt will keep playing music and you have all the time in the world that you need to, to lay whatever you have at the feet of Jesus. So on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it. He gave it to his disciples, and he said, this is my body, which is given to you, for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, when the, when the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks and he gave it to his disciples and he said, drink from it. All of you, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. If you have anything at all on your heart, I invite you to come forward to the altars. Father, thank you. Thank you for sending your son to die for us so that all of our sins could be forgiven. Thank you for His death, the resurrection, His ascension. And today as we celebrate the birth of of the Christian church, we see how you've, you've blessed your people throughout the years, throughout the centuries. And we we pray that we continue to experience that and and I pray that you'll lay it on our hearts and minds to go out and seek other people to know you. To know that we don't have to pressure them, that we can just love them and have a conversation with them. Let them know that you love them and that you can lift their burdens that you can save them and you can save their family and you can save their friends and release them from whatever it is that's holding them down. I 
I want to pray this morning for, for Dominique, who is still in the hospital. Pray for his family that's here this morning as they continue to faithfully come and be a part of this community. I pray that they know that we love them and you love them and that they can lean on you every step of the way. Pray for Rachel and the kids, that they're safe in their travels. They arrive and are able to relax for the next couple weeks. And I pray for everyone here, everyone in this room, everyone that's watching online, everyone in this community that is struggling with something. Maybe it's hard for them to admit. Maybe, maybe they're, they're tucking it way down deep and they're afraid to release it because it's just a lot of emotions. I pray you'll touch them right now to release it and give it to you so that they can be free from that prison, from those chains that drags us down. We love you, we thank you, we praise you for everything that you do for us, everything that you've given us, and we pray that we can just be the best that we can be and use the gift of the Holy Spirit that you gave us on this day so many years ago. to do your work. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. And I search the world
nothing is better than you oh there's nothing better than you there's nothing better than you lord there's nothing Today in God's grace, love, and peace, you are dismissed.